Welcome to Trash Talk MMA, the number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado, Antoine Peltier. Yo, welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and on today's episode, I have yet another spectacular guest, my good friend and head trainer at Tiger Muay Thai, John Priest. John, how you doing? Doing well, Antoine. Thanks for having me on the show today. All right, let's uh, let's give the listeners a little bit of background on you, John. Uh, I'm gonna I, I can fill in real quick here. Last year, I came out to Tiger Muay Thai to train Muay Thai. I did that for a month. Got pretty banged up by no fault of uh, the gym itself, but of my own uh, my own uh, stupidity and, and, and overtraining too quickly. I took a little bit of time off, came back to Thailand for 10 straight weeks, getting in the best shape of my life with John. He trained me like he would train a fighter, and I had a spectacular experience with him. So, John, why don't you uh, let the listeners know, what's your professional background? Um, well, I've been in the fitness industry in some capacity or another for a little over 15 years now. Uh, been a strength and conditioning coach, been in physical therapy, done instruction at university level, um, done some physical education teaching in secondary school. So a little bit of everything, really, uh, really pretty diverse in the services that I've done and the different uh, roles that I've, I've done over the years. You currently function what capacity at Tiger Muay Thai? Uh, right now, I'm currently the uh, fitness director and one of the strength and conditioning coaches, uh, along with my other staff. And uh, yeah, we just make sure that uh, all the fitness classes and fitness services and wellness services that we offer there to uh, the clients as well as the professional fight team are running smoothly and up to par. You're also a professional MMA fighter. Um, yes, not so much anymore. Trying to transition a little bit more into full-time coaching. Um, really can't keep up with the demand that uh, a full-time professional athlete, especially a mixed martial artist, uh, has to dedicate to his art and craft. Uh, so I'm spending a lot more time um, as a, a coach as opposed to a participant and athlete. I mean, I you know I trained with you and coached with you, and I had an absolutely fantastic time. And uh, I really feel that you have an incredible gift. And if you listen to you know the response that you get on uh, from other people that that train with you and on Twitter and on Facebook, obviously everybody feels that you're one of the best in the biz. So does this feel like the position you should be in? Do you feel like you're in a position? to give to people the most that you're able to? Um, Absolutely. You know, all our time as an athlete, uh, every athlete's time is only limited to how long he can compete. And then he's got to find um, a different role for himself for the rest of his life and career. Uh, Lucky for me, I've kind of surrounded myself with uh, within the fighting game and fighting business. So functioning as a full-time strength and conditioning coach as opposed to um, an athlete a little bit more is a comfortable role for me. Listen, you know, I love working with people. I love helping them out. Um, so doing this a little bit more than participating myself uh, is welcome, but I still certainly have that competitive desire every day as well. You know, what, what's your athletic background? What, what, what did you start getting, uh, you know, involved with, with strength and conditioning? What, what, what's your athletic background? Well, athletically, I've always participated in sports. Uh, I believe I Put on the helmet in American football for the first time when I was uh, six years old and played uh, all the way up to uh, competitive uh, Division I uh, American football in America. Uh, at the same time growing up, played a different variety of sports as well. Uh, wrestling, track and field, baseball, soccer, you know, all the traditional sports that kids participate in. But uh, American football was really my first and biggest love. Um, after I was done with that, at the age of 23, when I was uh, no longer playing, I still had a competitive desire, and uh, I was always a mixed martial arts fan, a big fan of martial arts in general, boxing, wrestling. So I transitioned to full-time into that and really didn't uh, waste any time. Okay, so that must have been in conjunction with your studies. I know you've got a lot of different degrees, certificates. I believe you're a kinesiologist? That's true. And a certified strength and conditioning coach. That is correct. And you've done professional fighting? Yes. <laughs> so that would be MMA? Uh, MMA and some boxing as well. Um, stand-up games are a little bit something uh, more that I'm comfortable and uh, interested in doing. Uh, I did wrestle a lot, folk style, uh, freestyle wrestling growing up. I enjoyed that quite a bit. But uh, 
American football was my first and biggest emphasis at the time. I just always dabbled in wrestling as more of a fun and off-season type of activity. You have now been at Tiger Muay Thai for approximately six months. Yes, just about six months as of uh, this month. Yep. Okay. So it's been interesting for me. I've been back here now in, uh, in Phuket for, uh, I guess, almost three weeks. And um, yeah, there's been there's a, there's a lot of different staff, a lot of people coming through there. And uh, there's obviously some some big names. So uh, I see that James McSweeney's joined the joined the crew there, teaching stand up striking, and uh, I believe you and him are, are collaborating a bit. No? Uh, yes, we've been working together a little bit. Uh, I've been training a lot with him since he came aboard uh, the Tiger team. Just a wealth of knowledge, uh, veteran of the sport, been participating in martial arts uh, at the highest level, and uh, been a participant his whole life. Just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, a great guy and a great coach has a really uh, interesting and uh, easy way to understand as a student. Yeah, it looks like um, it looks like Tiger Muay Thai is really committed to bringing in a lot of um, you know a lot of high high level and and visible names to uh, you know to their training staff. They've you know they had uh, Brian Ebersole there, uh, Roger Huerta is still there, uh, James McSweeney is in there, and there's also been quite a few uh, you know they're bringing in people for seminars. I heard uh, Cyril Diabati was in the house. Uh, Eddie Bravo was in the house. Yeah, we have a long uh, relationship with many uh, top UFC and MMA stars and combat sports uh, athletes in general. Uh, we come through uh, where well, we bring them in a few times a year to offer it to the clients as well as the residents here in Phuket. And just a, kind of a special thing to be able to come out here, train for a month, and then all of a sudden you get some hands-on instruction from some of the best athletes and uh, teachers in the world at their respective arts. So it's it's a really special, great opportunity for the guys that are training here. Yeah, I know that's the experience that I had too of how uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, there's people from all over the world here. It creates a, a casual environment, but where anybody's welcome and anybody can can feel like they're being supported because everybody out here has got some sort of athletic goal, whether it's to lose weight, become a professional fighter, just to learn the basics of fighting, just to learn Muay Thai or some or some boxing or some MMA, and it really creates a you know an interesting environment of uh, of different people, but that all have a common goal of getting healthy and and training as much as humanly possible. Yeah, that's really the tie that binds everybody here on. Uh... The soy tie ed, uh, I heard in your podcast the other day, you talk about it a little bit. Um, again, it's just a street here in Phuket that is, uh, rife with, uh, many Muay Thai and MMA gyms as well as fitness gyms, healthy, uh, healthy eating spots. Everybody here is in one way or another dedicated to improving themselves physically and mentally, whether it is through weight loss or fighters that are making a living, um, at fighting and in MMA. So. We have both sides of the spectrum and everybody in between. So sticking on the topic of known fighters, um, I believe you spent quite a bit of time in Vegas working with some pretty uh, pretty well-known guys. Who have you had the pleasure of training with? Um, really a who's who of uh, mixed martial artists, especially being in Vegas. You know, it is the fight capital of the world. Uh, my time when I was there I had great opportunity to meet basically – Almost any name that you could throw out there who makes his residence in America as a martial artist. They all travel through Vegas, whether it be for the big show or just to attend or to fight. So I've had a great opportunity to really work with many champions as well as uh, just many professional athletes uh, from combat sports, whether it be boxing, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, MMA. Um, it's just a great mecca to be able to be exposed to so many uh, great athletes in one area. It's, it's just a rare opportunity that I had. I remember when we were training last year, uh, we, you spoke several times of, of Roy Nelson. I believe you you took a shot from him. How'd that feel? Uh, it didn't feel good, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, probably the hardest that I've ever been hit in my life. And uh, I've run full speed into... You know, many 300-pound linemen in American football, and I'll tell you, I take that every day over a, a nice straight right from Roy Nelson. <laughs> so besides Roy, uh, I mean, any other interesting anecdotes, any other interesting personalities? Um, I think probably every professional that I ever rolled with had my number at one time or another. Um, but that, that one that really sticks out because uh, he really rocked me really good. And uh, 
I always kind of prided myself on having a pretty good chin, and I'll tell you, he uh, he slowed me down pretty pretty good with that shot. So I guess for you to see uh, somebody like Mark Hunt tag him on the chin and watch him face plant must have been awkward. Awkward, unexpected, but uh, heck, you know, Mark Hunt's been doing that for years to to many fighters. So uh, you know, don't, no disrespect to Roy, but that's no shame to uh, to take an L from Mark Hunt in that in that fashion. Just before you got here, I recorded another podcast because there's just been a this deluge of incredible um, fights lined up by the US, from the UFC uh, between now and the middle of June. Um, so yeah, there's Alistair Overeem against uh, against Roy Nelson, and I think that's just a fight, uh, that's a perfect fight for Roy Nelson to do his thing. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I was just speaking with uh, Sam Bastin, who you had on your podcast just a couple days ago, and uh, we were discussing this fight exactly, and uh you know, we both shared the opinion that, uh, you know, Roy edges him out in every uh, facet on paper. And just we both kind of agreed that uh, we think Roy's going to get the stoppage win on this one. And then speaking of Mark Hunt, he's actually going to be fighting uh, Stipe Miocic. And that's going to be a gnarly fight. I mean, Stipe looked fucking great against Junior Dos Santos, even in a loss. You know, that guy's tough as nails. Uh, that's a heavyweight fight that uh, I'm looking forward to. It's been a while since I've seen one that... Uh, that really uh, popped out at me as one that I'm gonna I'm gonna hit pause and make sure that I'm tuning in for that one. Uh, the heavyweight division, the UFC has been a little bit lackluster in my opinion as of lately, but uh, that's a fight that I think a lot of people are gonna want to see. So another another uh, topic that's made a lot of waves, obviously right now, are you know all these MMA fighters, in particular in the UFC, who are getting busted for um, for performance enhancing drugs. While I was training with you. Um, you made it such a priority to to keep things healthy, to make sure. I mean, you would always emphasize that I, emphasize that I needed to sleep, needed to take naps, needed to eat clean, needed to hydrate. I know with your professional background, your uh, educational background, that health and the way that fitness and all these pieces tie together in martial arts, it's one of the things that, that make you a great coach and a great trainer. What's your take on what's going on right now? in the sport of MMA, and how big of a problem are PEDs? Um, well, I'm of the opinion, having been around the sport for quite a while, especially in the uh, in the gym, not necessarily as a spectator, but actually in the gym doing the work with these guys. i got to say, frankly, I'm really not that surprised that uh, a lot of it is coming to light as of right now. I just think that it's a result of doing a lot of the out-of-competition testing that they're starting to institute. I think that's uh, really... The telltale sign of the result of why so many of those guys are testing positive. It's not that it's all of a sudden a, uh, a new fad uh, to be using performance enhancing drugs, especially in combat athletics. But the out of competition testing is really what's exposing a lot of these guys that this is a regular part of this, their routine. Yeah. Um, this isn't a new thing in the sport at all. It's immersed in the culture. And to be fair to uh, martial arts in particular, listen, this is rife in all professional sports. When money of these kind of numbers and figures that we're talking about is on the line, you can't put it past people that are trying to get a competitive edge. Now you can uh, make your own opinions on whether you think that's right or wrong, but that's more of a moral issue rather than a black and white state of the union as uh, I kind of see it. So as an athletic professional, John, and as well as a health professional, do you feel that there's a place in uh, in MMA or in combat sports in general where, based on the wear and tear that these guys are putting themselves through, these grueling training camps, you know, none of us have, I mean, you have an idea, but the general public, we just watch these sports, we see these guys go out there, put their health and their lives on the line, and we can't begin to comprehend the physical, emotional, and spiritual agony these guys are going through. Despite these products being illegal, these performance-enhancing drugs, do you feel that there could or should be a place for these products to allow these people to heal correctly or to deal with these levels of, of, of trauma that, they're, that, they're, you know, that exist in their lives as part of their jobs? Um, that's an interesting question, you know. Um... I think you'd have to approach it maybe on a case-by-case basis, but blanketly saying, uh, uh, no, I don't think that there's a place for one person to have a competitive edge over the other um, for what is blatantly against the rules uh, as sanctioned by the Athletic Commission. As to your point, yes, the sport and preparation involved in, the, in this and in showing up the night of the fight 
is a miracle in itself that they show up healthy, ready to go and perform at their best. However, being said that though, that's, uh, that's the business they've chosen. Um, it's a difficult road. It's a lot of wear and tear, like you said, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually. But these guys are competing for their livelihood, for putting uh, food on the table for their families and, and whatnot. So to say that one person is going to uh, eclipse another uh, based on um, a simple solution as to taking a foreign substance or one that's uh, blatantly illegal, I'm of the opinion that I, I don't think that that's right, if that's a, a moral question. Yeah, it's funny because as a fan, you know, and somebody on the outside looking in, um, you hear of you hear of guys getting busted for PEDs, you know, of late. Of course, the great Anderson Silva, uh, Hector Lombard, you know, a lot of big name guys, and and it's almost it's it's becoming numbing at this point. I think uh, when we heard that Anderson Silva got popped, obviously that was just like what, like really, you know, because then you, this is a guy who, you know, embodies what we perceive to be really the, the, the spirit of martial arts, somewhat like a, you know, like a Lyoto Machida and Lyoto Machida and rolling back to, to like a Bruce Lee. So it's shocking, but you know, the guy, you know, he had his leg snapped in half, like clean, he had his leg slapped in half, snapped in half in two places in a fight. He came back a year later to compete, gets busted. It obviously shook me up. It's obviously shook up the industry. And as we can see from the UFC's response, uh, you know, they, they're very aware now that the problem is out of control and that it's tarnishing the sport in itself and in particular their brand. My take on it is I think that MMA fighters are nuts for doing what they do, that they're, they're, you know, they're involved in a job that none of us can fathom and that is completely outlandish in that they're, you know, they're trying to knock each other out and rip each other's arms out of the socket. That into itself is crazy. So the fact that they could be doing crazy things to, to, to be prepared for that or to heal from that somewhere inside of me, I'm kind of fine with it where I'm not fine with it. And this is when you get into kind of the Lance Armstrongishness of it all is that if there's people that are having more success and that are making more money and have access to more resources, they obviously have access to better technology and are getting away with using these things, whereas other people can't. And that, to me, is what's creating an uneven playing field. Um, absolutely. Like uh, to your point, um, where one person might have be exposed to and have access to certain substances that can increase their performance, and one person doesn't. Uh, in my mind, that's a clear black and white of fair versus unfair. Um, whether you allow and get into the discussion of whether it's okay for this person to use it because of the circumstance, whether they be recovering from surgery, etc., cetera, uh, that's a really slippery slope. You're opening up um, uh, a can of worms in that, that it's going to be a case by case basis. And who makes the, who makes the decision on this person's okay to use it? This person isn't. Um, that's a very uh, ambiguous way to kind of weigh out and deal with this, uh, with this issue that I think is not, by far, is not over. I think we're just kind of scratching the surface to some of the issues that are going to come up. Yeah, I posted uh, two interesting articles on my uh, on my website on TrashTalkMMA.com. The first one was a, a pretty succinct summary of the recent UFC press conference that occurred on February 18th, where they're outlining what their plans are and that they intend to roll out, I believe, four months from now at the start of July. And uh, on top of that, I also posted an article by a combat sports lawyer out of British Columbia, Canada, who's um, written some uh, written an interesting article about the potential roadblocks that the UFC is going to face trying to implement, uh, you know, which is their ideal PED stomp out strategy. I don't know if have you had the opportunity to uh, sort of educate yourself on the, the, late, the latest news about this this issue. Uh, I did have a chance to brush over that article um, earlier this uh, this evening, but uh, I'm really kind of getting entrenched into these latest um, latest things that are coming out because uh, I think that it's just going to stir up more and more problems, and we certainly haven't seen the end of this issue. Yeah, well, what I what I think uh, one of the main issues that they're bringing up is that. Essentially, right now, the way things have been is a guy could get busted for doing PEDs, and essentially, it really hasn't hurt them very much. They're always able to to compete after the fact. They're out a little bit longer than they normally would be between fights, but essentially, you know, 
guys are now fighting. Most guys fight twice a year. So that's every six months. They get busted for roids. They're out for nine. I'm sure a lot of these guys are happy to sit out for nine <laughs> because they can just rest up and, uh, you know, and get back in shape and, 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 and learn some new, uh, some new techniques. I was also, I also followed an article recently by Brendan Schaub who, who gave his opinion on, um, on the matter. And, and basically, if you, if you, if you listen to what he had to say, it's just, it made sense for people to use PEDs and to get busted on them that it basically just worked out well for them. I think now what the UFC is going to be very strict with is that they plan on suspending guys from two to four years. And this is for first time offenders. So I, I think that's, you know, that's going to be huge in that if you can't work for two to four years, you're basically out of a career. What's going to be crazy is to see if guys are going to get caught, who are those guys going to be? What main card or main event fights is this going to flush down the toilet? And what will the cost of that be to the UFC itself due to this out of competition testing? Well, absolutely. Just like anything, any crime or uh, if you want to deter people away from performing a certain act or taking a certain action or a certain behavior, then the punishment has to uh, be enough to deter them away from that. If you are just spending them for, say, six months, like you said, the first example, well, a lot of guys are welcome to taking that six months break, you know, where they don't have to fight. They can uh, rest and relax, work on their techniques and so on. Um, but also that opens up an issue that that's going to affect different fighters much differently. Um, a champion or somebody were, uh, fighting on the main card, um, his payout or purse per fight might be enough to take care of him and his family for a year where a lower tiered fighter might have to fight a handful of times in a year just to make ends meet. So a punishment of suspending them for six months, that lower level fighter, of course, that's going to have a big impact on his career. A guy who's a pay-per-view all-star, maybe not so much. Yeah. And then you also throw into uh, the mix this new Reebok sponsorship deal in the UFC that prevents fighters from getting sponsorship outside of the UFC and that have you, have you followed that a bit? They basically, they're getting sponsored. Reebok is the sole sponsor and they're going to provide tiers of sponsorship. If you're in the top five in the rankings, you get more than the guy from six to 10, than the guy from 11 to 15. And I believe everybody that's considered unranked, AKA that you're not in the top 15 is like a tier four. So there's just a lot of moving parts right now. And it's going to be interesting to see, I mean, a big machine like the UFC, how they're going to tie all these together keep the sport running, keep the compelling matchups, keep making compelling cards, and keeping their fighters happy and healthy. Well, that's going to be interesting, especially with all the... I think that's a completely separate issue, but one just as, uh, just as interesting, um, bringing up just as many perhaps issues for people, is the uh, blanket monopolized uh, sponsorship deals that are happening now in the UFC. Um in my opinion, it's going more and more to um, not empower these fighters to be able to control their careers, um, be able to make their incomes and set themselves up and their families to take care of them. Um, you're really limiting their earning potential and sort of pegging them into what potentially they can make. Uh, you know as well as I do, certain fighters make heaps load more in sponsorship deals than others. And with these latest sponsorship deals, you're rigid, really pigeonholing. And uh, a lot of these fighters, you're really putting a low ceiling on what their true earning potential is, especially from outside sponsors. You know, I'm a huge MMA fan. It's the only sport that I follow religiously. And, um, you know, I'm the first one to watch some cards, watch some fights, and be the first one to, to criticize. And, and, you know, I say, who's this guy? Who's this can? Who's this, you know, and, you know, as if, if a guy is not a star, it's almost like he's a nobody. And yet these nobodies are in the UFC, which is the pinnacle of fight leagues. A lot of these recent cards that we've been watching, I've been, you know, highlighting this on my podcasts. I've made it a habit now whenever there's a whenever there's a card to go on Wikipedia, sort of look at the background of the card, look at the ma look at the matchups that are being made, and you'll see now that there's a ton of fighters that don't have Wikipedia entries. You know, and it's alarming. It's alarming to think that, okay, I've arrived. I'm on the prelims, sometimes even on the main card of a UFC event, and nobody knows who I am. And if you Google me, almost nothing comes up. I mean that's such a far cry from where the industry was but a few years ago. Like I remember back to uh, 
what was it, in 2007 when they merged Pride with the UFC? And, you know, and it was just blockbuster, blockbuster, blockbuster. You know, Pride would always put on these massive cards with stars from top to bottom. The UFC, maybe not so much, but always the main cards stacked. And now we're seeing cards where, I mean, there's times when 60 to 70% of the fighters, I've never heard of them. Those guys, how do they earn? Some, you know, difficult questions. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that brings up a great point. A lot of these lower level fighters, I can't imagine, again, we know what the uh, the average payout is for a lot of these uh, lower tiered fighters, those that aren't fighting on the uh, pay-per-view main cards. Um, and it's not much. Um, me and, again, Sam, right before uh, this podcast, we were looking over some of the upcoming cards and getting excited about talking about the fights, as we do. And so many of them uh, were rife with these unknown fighters. And perhaps that's from the number of events that uh, the UFC in particular is putting out there. Um, I don't think anybody will disagree and that it's really watering down the product for us as a, as a spectator. Yeah, like I said earlier today, I um, just before you got here, I quickly uh, I quickly did some research of all the basically every single event from UFC 184 to, to 188 because there's just been some blockbuster announcements, and I broke down all the top matchups. And it's funny because I'm excited that there are all these great fights coming up, and that there's basically a fight every week. I mean, I can never get enough MMA as long as the fights are good, but. The fact of the matter is that he, a few short years ago, these fights would have just all been on three or four cards, and now they're spread out over 15 or 16. I mean, I think it's good that there's a regular product out there and that it is branded correctly, that it is a UFC product, which guarantees a certain level of quality. But I fear that, you know, even myself, I try to keep up to speed on everything that's going on, and it's just when there's names that you don't know, it's just so hard to get motivated, you know, to get excited about the card. A UFC event used to be that, an event, and now it's a card. Oh, exactly right. I mean, that's that's the main point is uh, I can remember, too, back uh, th- those times that we were talking about back around the merger, just even a f- few short years ago where um, a card was coming up and we were excited about watching every single one, every fight. We knew who those guys were, and we were excited about seeing them. Now, I'm lucky if I know one or two of the matchups on all these cards because there is one literally every weekend. Um, I do think that it hurts the product of the UFC as far as um, what we perceive it to be, why that is, why they've decided to put out so many different uh, cards and so many events. I'm not quite sure. I mean, the simple... Answer to that question, of course, is money. Obviously, they're making it or else they wouldn't be constantly putting out these events. But as a spectator, I can't honestly say that there's been a card in recent memory where I've been foaming at the mouth to check out every single matchup where it used to seem like that was the case. Yeah, every single matchup, uh, that's that's very rare. Uh, obviously, you know, there's already been some big fights this year. I think everybody tuned in to, to John Jones and Cormier. But... Um, Speaking of, you know, deep cards, uh, I know I'm often harassing you with tidbits and links to uh, interesting daily MMA news, and it's rare that uh, you hit me up, but uh, you were the first one to break to me the news of the main card of UFC 187, and I know you jacked up for that one with, uh, what do we got? We got John Jones against Anthony Rumble Johnson. That's going to be a massacre. And uh, Vitor Belfort versus Chris Weidman for the middleweight title. What about what about that card's got you excited, and what do you think of these matchups? Um, well, to your point, absolutely. I mean, this has been the best card, um, at least um, presented on paper for me. And as you said, uh, you never know. Sometimes the surprising no names uh, are the best fights. But this one's got me real excited. I'm a big fan of a lot of these fighters, um, particularly uh, the Vitor Belfort uh, Chris Weidman fight. Super jacked for that. And uh, also to see Cowboy in action again. He does not have an easy fight. I think perhaps his toughest matchup in years, if not ever. Um, he's going to have a bear of a time. Yeah, of course. So uh, Donald Cerrone, uh, the, the the Russian we're referencing, is Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, I have a, always a hard time remembering and pronouncing his name. Um, it's great to see these uh, 
this influx of Eastern Europeans in the UFC. Um, yeah, so, you know, Pride obviously had uh, the Fedor and Alexander Emelianenko. There was Igor Vochanchin. He's one of my favorite fighters of all time. Uh, Mirko Krokop, you know, from Croatia. You know, again, Eastern European presence. And, and in the UFC, that's kind of fallen out. Now, you guys have a lot of these guys coming through Tiger Muay Thai as well. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we have a very big presence of uh, Russian fighters coming through um, our camp here at Tiger in uh, Phuket. I'll tell you what, uh, they've always had a big presence in combat th- combat athletics through history, whether it be through boxing, wrestling. Um, so it's about time that they're getting their respect uh, in mixed martial arts because all these guys come ready and motivated to train. Uh, they got a great mindset, and I think it's just something ingrained in their culture where uh, – they're pretty. They're pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, they're just. They just seem to be tough bastards, man. I was just. Um, <laughs> I was just in uh, in Russia actually for New Year's. If, if people don't know, I've been you know I've been traveling the world for the past fifteen months, uh, just going all over the place, and uh, I ended up in uh, in Russia for um, for New Year's Eve and and the Orthodox Christmas, and uh, I found myself uh, in the outskirts in a, in a in a small town that's about a twenty minute train ride east of Moscow called Tchaikovsky, after the famous um, composer, and uh, yeah, people live rugged, man. They live rugged. You know, you got uh, you got some people that are living in some pretty precarious conditions, and that's perfectly normal. And I think you know we're a bunch of spoiled Westerners, man. <laughs> and I mean, even coming out here to Thailand, you know, where, where are you from? You're from Florida? Yeah, originally from Florida. Uh, been in Las Vegas for about the last eight years prior to my move out here to Thailand. So, you know, both uh, relatively cozy environments. I don't think anybody ever complains, uh, as long as you don't mind the heat, that nobody's going to complain about being in Vegas or, or Florida. You know, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia. I've, I've been spoiled. I've lived in the French Alps, in Paris, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego. So, again, just, you know, great very civilized places, you know, that have a, a very high standard of living and a high level of comfort. And even coming out here to Phuket, you know, for some people, if you're not used to it and you plan on spending certain months, it's it's important to arm yourself with a bit of a mentality of, of simplifying your life. It, I think it allows you to uh, appreciate it and just get back to basics, you know. But these Russians, man, um, good to see them. Yeah, because they, they brought in a bunch into Bellator. So basically a couple of years ago, they started... Uh, so I bring a lot of guys into Bellator and they've been making a lot of noise over there. And it's interesting to see that the UFC um, finally followed suit. I think they've had almost like a a difficult time negotiating and doing business with, with Russians in the UFC. And it's what prevented Fedor from ever fighting there, which uh, to me, I know uh, I know we both uh, are huge Fedor fans. I think you're even a bigger fan of him than I am. And I didn't know that was possible. But um, I'm glad to see that, uh, you know, again, we talk about this, this, this diversification of cards and it's great to see them going to new places and that we are going to be exposed to great fighters from other places than the typical, you know, Canada, United States, Brazil, Japan, and a few small pockets in Europe. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, for our North American fans listening in too, um, that's just an enlightenment on the how much UFC is synonymous with the sport of MMA, um, almost to the point where we have this joke where someone always asks, and you know they're a newbie or they don't know, uh, do you watch UFC or do you participate in UFC? Uh, they don't call it MMA. They actually call it the promotion's name. You know, there's a lot of promotions all over the globe that have some amazing fighters. You know, M1 in Russia, 1FC is doing a lot of great work here in Asia. So, I mean, there's talent all over the world. It's just now that the UFC is starting to pluck some of those guys out of Eastern Europe, some of those Russian fighters. Um, but they've been doing their thing a long time in some of these smaller promotions and just probably haven't gotten their, their kudos yet. But uh, a lot of people are starting to pay attention because they are going to the big show. Yeah, I know it's cool. I mean, I came out here last year and um, and trained at Tiger Muay Thai, and and since then it's been uh, it's been cool to to turn on a UFC event and hear guys and see guys rocking the shorts, rocking the jerseys, the banners, and that uh, they're you know they're now getting their own fighters into into the sport. So uh, I, I think that's a, a fantastic level of growth for the camp itself. Great exposure. And it certainly adds an incredible level of credibility to uh, the training that's going on there. Absolutely. A lot of people are now, you know, showing up again. Tiger Muay Thai in the last few years has come into a global presence 
really a brand that's known in uh, countries all over the world. So people are making it a point to come out here and do their training camps with our amazing staff and facilities here. Um, guys like Roger Huerta, James McSweeney that you spoke about. You know, these are, are respected veterans in the sport with a lot of know-how. And they're teaching these guys and training these guys hands-on and also promoting them and getting them in touch with these big promotions so that the eyes can be on them and uh, get them to the big show because their talent deserves to be recognized. Yeah, and, you know, I, I follow Huerta and McSweeney on, uh, you know, on their Facebooks and, and their Twitters. And um, there seems to be a, such a, a great level and, and desire for them to share and to bring other people up. Uh, it's not like, hey, we, you know, we've discovered certain techniques and we, you know, because both of these guys are still fighting professionally. They're both fighting in 1FC, um, you know, and it, it's it's great to see that people don't have a, a protectionist mentality over their, their savoir faire and their knowledge. And, you know, and every single day you walk around Tiger Muay Thai and you just see these guys walking around and they're having smoothies with people out there. They're in the cage with these guys. They're rolling around in group classes and it's very, very hands on, very tactile. And, um, you know, these guys just have a really open mentality to sharing their wealth of knowledge with everybody who comes through there. Yeah, when it comes to the team mentality uh, in MMA in particular, there is a lot of lip service paid to that. A lot of people talk the talk, but uh, you go to their gyms and uh, you're basically just a low line fruit or a punching bag for a few years till you get your respect. Um, but contrary to that out here, Tiger, you know, it's... Uh, it is. It's a legitimate family. You know, we're all out here. Nobody here, uh, none of our fighters are local Thai people. So we all come from a different place in the world, but we come here together for the same goal. So if we can help each other out in any way, we're all here to succeed. We're all here to chase our goals, whatever they might be. So we just have a, an amazing, diverse team here with talent in every different regard here. So you can really focus on yourself um, train hard, accomplish your goals, and enjoy the nice things about life, the, the little things, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously there's no shortage of facilities in North America to train, or in, or in Europe for that matter, Western Europe for that matter. But um, I think there's there's something uh, exotic about, about coming here to do it. You know, a lot of people... Uh, you know, think of Thailand as this, this far distant place, and it is a far distant place. But you know, once you get here, um, there is no language barrier. You know, there's a ton of a ton of people speaking all languages, and uh, obviously, if you have English, it's uh, that, that that really gets you uh, exactly where you got to be. But it's a uh, it's a cool experience to uh, to just come to a, a foreign country and to still have enough reference points by the people that are there, the people that are working there and training you to to feel comfortable in that home and like you're being well taken care of. Well, that's really the universal language is that of passion for martial arts and wellness in general and uh, just the accountability that we have to each other to ensure that we're all getting better together. Um, it's not as much fun or as rewarding if one of us succeeds, if all the rest of us get left in the wake. You know, we're all here to make sure that we all uh, can accomplish our goals and get as close to it as we can and enjoy the ride in the meantime. Exactly. So this has been a, this has been a great time, John. I really thank you for coming out. If people want to stay in touch with you, if they want to follow you, what, uh, what's your social media? What's the best way to, to hit you up and to keep track of what John Priest is up to? Uh, best way to stay in touch with me or follow me, what I'm doing here at uh, Tiger or otherwise with strength and conditioning, they can go to my Facebook page. That is Team Leader Performance Training. Or they could check out my Instagram at Team Leader PT. Excellent. Are you on Twitter? Uh, I'm not currently on Twitter. I'm a little social media backwards, but uh, I'm getting it together. And uh, in the meantime, please follow the Instagram, follow the Facebook, trying to get as much useful training information as well as what's going on here at our camp, um, just to stay in touch with the fans all over the world. Excellent. Well, I can certainly vouch I trained uh, firsthand with John for 10 weeks and it transformed my life. I'll, uh, I'll try to get some pictures of what I looked like before and after and it was, uh, it was very impressive and overall it was just a very enjoyable experience. Um, you know, I, I, I specified my objectives. We kept expectations realistic but very aggressive and ambitious. 
And uh, I was blown away by, by what I accomplished. And I know I couldn't have done it without John. I know a lot of people, they want to get healthy. They want to get in shape. They want to put on some muscle. And they really don't know how to go about it. And it's just like anything in life, guys. Get a coach. Get a trainer. If ever you want to know how to do anything well in life, there's people out there who know how to do it, who've been dedicated in their lives to it. And I can attest to John Priest, he knows his shit like the back of his hand. All right, John, it's been a pleasure. I know you're a busy man. I'm going to let you run off. Uh, I'm going to be out here for a while. So this is just the first in a series of many podcasts I'm hoping to do with you. Thanks for coming out, buddy. I will be seeing you soon. My pleasure, Tuan. Thanks for having me. And yeah, looking forward to doing this again real soon, guys. Excellent. This was the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelletier, with my guest, John Priest. Follow me on my Facebook page, at Trash Talk MMA on Twitter. Download the podcast and leave a five-star rating. That'd be awesome. That gets the message out to as many people as possible. All right, guys. Catch you soon. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at TrashTalkMMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag TrashTalkMMA. So, John, why don't you uh, let the listeners know, what's your professional background? Um, Well, I've been in the fitness industry in some capacity or another for a little over 15 years now. Uh, been a strength and conditioning coach, been physical therapy, done instruction at university level, um, done some physical education teaching in secondary school. So a little bit of everything, really, uh, really pretty diverse in the services that I've done in the different uh, roles that I've, I've done over the years. You currently function what capacity at Tiger Muay Thai? Uh, right now, I'm currently the uh, fitness director and one of the strength and conditioning coaches, uh, along with my other staff. And, uh, yeah, we just make sure that uh, all the fitness classes and fitness services and wellness services that we offer there to uh, the clients as well as the professional fight team are running smoothly and up to par. You're also a professional MMA fighter. Um, yes, not so much anymore. Trying to transition a little bit more into full-time coaching. Um, really can't keep up with the demand that uh, a full-time professional athlete, especially a mixed martial artist, uh, has to dedicate to his art and craft. Uh, so I'm spending a lot in this trip. And a certified strength and conditioning coach? That is correct. And you've done professional fighting? Yes. <laughs> so that would be MMA? Uh, MMA and some boxing as well. Um, stand-up games are a little bit something uh, more that I'm comfortable and uh, interested in doing. Uh, I did wrestle a lot folk style, uh, freestyle wrestling growing up. I enjoyed that quite a bit. But uh, American football was my first and biggest emphasis at the time. I just always dabbled in wrestling as more of a fun and off-season type of activity. You have now been at Tiger Muay Thai for approximately six months. Yes, just about six months as of uh, this month. Yep. Okay. So it's been interesting for me. I've been back here now in, uh, in Phuket for, uh, I guess, almost three weeks. And um, yeah, there's been there's a, a lot of different staff, a lot of people coming through there. And uh, there's obviously some some big names. So uh, I see that James McSweeney's joined the joined the crew there, teaching stand up striking. And uh, I believe you and him are, are collaborating a bit. No. Uh, yes, we've been working together a little bit. Uh, I've been training a lot with him since today as well. You know, what, what's your athletic background? What 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 did you start getting uh, you know involved with with strength and conditioning? What, what what's your athletic background? Well, athletically, I've always participated in sports. Uh, I believe I put on the helmet in American football for the first time when I was uh, six years old and played uh, all the way up to uh, competitive uh, Division I uh, American football in America. Uh, at the same time growing up, played a different variety of sports as well, uh, wrestling, track and field, baseball, soccer, you know, all the traditional sports that kids participate in. But uh, American football was really my first and biggest love. Um, after I was done with that, at the age of 23, when I was uh, no longer playing, I still had a competitive desire, and uh, I was always a mixed martial arts fan, a big fan of martial arts in general, boxing, wrestling. So I transitioned to full-time into that and really didn't uh, waste any time. Okay, so that must have been in conjunction with your studies. I know you've got a lot of different degrees, certificates. I believe you're a kinesiologist. 
Trash Talk MMA, the number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado, Antoine Peltier. Yo, welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and on today's episode, I have yet another spectacular guest, my good friend and head trainer at Tiger Muay Thai, John Priest. John, how you doing? Doing well, Antoine. Thanks for having me on the show today. All right, let's uh, let's give the listeners a little bit of background on you, John. Uh, I'm gonna I, I can fill in real quick here. Last year, I came out to Tiger Muay Thai to train Muay Thai. I did that for a month. Got pretty banged up by no fault of uh, the gym itself, but of my own uh, my own uh, stupidity and, and, and overtraining too quickly. I took a little bit of time off, came back to Thailand for 10 straight weeks, getting in the best shape of my life with John. He trained me like he would train a fighter, and I had a spectacular experience with him. So More time um, as a coach as opposed to a participant and athlete. I mean, I, you know, I trained with you and coached with you and I had an absolutely fantastic time. And uh, I really feel that you have an incredible gift. And if you listen to, you know, the response that you get on uh, from other people that, that train with you and on Twitter and on Facebook, obviously everybody feels that you're one of the best in the biz. So does this feel like the position you should be in? Do you feel like you're in a position to give to people the most that you're able to? Um, absolutely. You know, all our time as an athlete, uh, every athlete's time is only limited to how long he can compete. And then he's got to find um, a different role for himself for the rest of his life and career. Uh, lucky for me, I've kind of surrounded myself with uh, within the fighting game and fighting business. So functioning as a full-time strength and conditioning coach as opposed to um, an athlete a little bit more is a comfortable role for me. Listen, you know, I love working with people. I love helping them out. Um, so doing this a little bit more than participating myself uh, is welcome, but I still certainly have that competitive desire every 